Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you on perioperative management of hyperglycemia. I will start with a case scenario. Mrs. XY, a 55-year-old previously healthy woman admitted to surgical casualty with right hypochondriac pain and fever for two, two days. She was hemodynamically stable. Her capillary blood sugar was 258 milligrams per deciliter. She was not a diagnosed patient with diabetes. Diagnosis of acute cholecystitis was made. Medical referral was done for management of hyperglycemia. What do you all think? What is the reason for the hyperglycemia? Is it due to undiagnosed diabetes or due to stress-induced hyperglycemia? How do you find it out? This table shows the diagnostic criteria for diabetes. Just concentrate on the middle column. It shows cutoff values for diabetes. Fasting blood sugar more than 126 milligrams per deciliter. OGTT two hour value after 75 gram glucose ingestion more than 200 milligram per deciliter. deciliter. Or HbA1c more than 6.5%. In a patient with classic symptoms of hyperglycemia or hyperglycemic crisis, a random Plasma glucose, more than 200 mg per deciliter, confirms the diagnosis of diabetes. Otherwise, diagnosis requires two abnormal test results mentioned above from the same sample or in two separate samples. So we need to check HbA1c in all hospitalized patients with newly diagnosed hyperglycemia. If the HbA1c is more than, more than 6.5, it is due to undiagnosed diabetes. If it is between 5.7 to 6.5, that would suggest prediabetes. If it is less than 5.7, that would suggest stress-induced hyperglycemia. In patients with CBS more than 140 milligrams per deciliter or HbA1c more than 6.5%, we need to monitor capillary blood sugar levels regularly. So coming back to the case scenario, a detailed history was taken and patient has had osmotic symptoms, polyuria, polydopsia for a few weeks. And the admission HbA1c came as 9.4 and the diagnosis of type two diabetes was made. And she was started treatment for both infection and hyperglycemia. Let us see the glycemic targets and the treatment options. What are the glycemic targets for acutely ill hospitalized patients? Patients with non-critical illness, the targets are less than 140 for pre-meal sugar levels and less than 180 for random values. You may modify the targets according to the clinical scenario on individual basis. In selected patients, more tight control of blood sugar levels can be re recommended only if it is possible without hypoglycemia. In patients with terminal illness or with multiple comorbidities, this stringent control even more than 180 milligrams per deciliter is acceptable. Let us discuss how to treat hypoglycemia detected in hospitalized patients. Insulin is the preferred treatment. Initiate insulin therapy when blood glucose level is persistently more than 180. And continuous intravenous insulin infusion is the most effective method for critically ill patients. Patients with type one diabetes, they must be maintained on insulin therapy at all times to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis. This diagram shows how to calculate the insulin dose for non-critically ill patients. I will zoom out the picture. In non-critically ill hospitalized patients with diabetes or stress-induced hyperglycemia, subcutaneous insulin regime is recommended. And it should consist of 
basal insulin, bolus insulin, and correction insulin components. The first box shows how, the cal how to calculate the total daily insulin dose. 50% of it is given as bolus insulin, and you can give basal insulin once or twice a day. If you're using long-acting analogs like Largy, Detema, Degludec, it can be given once a day. When you're using intermediate insulin like NPH, it is given twice a day. 50% of the calculated total daily dose is given as bolus insulin. So you can give rapid or short-acting insulin in three equally divided doses before each meal. If patient is not able to eat, you need to hold the bolus insulin. The adjustments to the insulin dose should be done according to the correction scale and the CB, CBG levels. The number of units of regular or rapid acting insulin per dose is shown in each column. Start at insulin sensitive column in patients who are elderly and those with impaired renal functions. Start at insulin usual column if the patient is able and expected to eat all or most of his meals. Start at insulin resistant column in patients receiving corticosteroids and those treated with more than 80 units per day before admission. If the patient is not able to eat, give regular insulin every six hourly or rapid acting insulin every four to six hourly and you need to follow the sensitive column. Coming back to the case scenario, hyperglycemia was managed with insulin and acute cholecystitis was managed with intravenous antibiotics. She was discharged on both insulin and oral hypoglycemic drug. Interval laparoscopic cholecystectomy was scheduled in four to six weeks time. Let us discuss how to prepare a patient with diabetes for an elective surgery. We will discuss pre-op operation, peri-op and post-op management separately. First of all, we'll see the pathophysiology of hyperglycemia. The stress of infections, trauma, and injury cause a neuroendocrine stress response with release of counter-regulatory hormones and inflammatory cytokines, such as epinephrine, glucagon, cortisol, growth hormone, inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and TNF-alpha. These neurohumoral changes result in metabolic abnormalities such as insulin resistance, decreased peripheral glucose utilization, impaired insulin secretion, increased lipolysis, and protein catabolism. There are a lot of other contributory factors that exacerbate the response in a surgical patient. What are those? Type of surgery, type of anesthesia, hypothermia, drugs like steroids, vasopressors, immunosuppressives, and enteral and parenteral feeding. This cartoon shows how the activation of autonomic nervous system produce those changes. Final result would be protein catabolism and lipolysis. Exaggerated gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, and insulin resistance, giving rise to hyperglycemia. And this is another schematic presentation of the above cascade due to metabolic stress. What are the outcome of poor glycemic control? Will cause poor surgical and overall outcome. Those are infections, poor bone healing, acute kidney injury, acute coronary events, high mortality rate, lengthy hospital stay, so on. For elective surgery, early preoperative optimization should be arranged by the treating physician. Satisfactory level of glycemic control, that is, required HbA1c should be targeted before the surgery. 
patient assessment should be done to evaluate risk of hypoglycemia, hypoglycemic awareness, diabetes-related complications, like renal autonomic neuropathy and macrovascular diseases, etc. The goals of preoperative glycemic management include prevention of hypoglycemia, prevention of hypoglycemia, prevention of diabetic emergencies like diabetic ketoacidosis and hyposmolacoma. So HbA1c target should be less than 8.5%. If it is more than that, you need to refer to a specialist team. So when the glycemic control is suboptimal, where the benefit versus arm of early surgery and may need to delay the surgery. At the admission to the ward for an elective surgery, check the consistency of medication already on and prescribed at the admission. Document the medications, those are self-administered by the patient and monitor capillary blood glucose regularly. When you operate on high-risk patients with poor glycemic control or with diabetes-related complications, book, a, book an ICU HDU bed in advance. If patient has high risk of peripheral arterial disease, take measures to prevent pressure ulcers. Use DVT preventive stockings with caution. Maintain glycemic target of 110 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, especially for anesthetized sedated patients, and for patients on insulin or sulfonylureas, which carry the risk of hypoglycemia. For awake patients, a lower glucose value of 70 mg is acceptable, and it does not warrant rescue therapy. Where do you keep your patient in the theater list? What do you think? Patient with diabetes should need to come up in the list as the first case. If the fasting period is expected to be limited to one missed meal, the patient can be managed by modification of his or her usual diabetic medications. This table shows how the modification can be done in anti-diabetic therapies before surgery, day prior to admission and day of surgery. These tables demonstrate the detailed descriptions for individual drug classes. Further, the dose modifications according to the timing of the surgery are shown, which includes a separate columns for morning procedures and for the afternoon procedures. If patient is fasting for more than one meal, the insulin dose modification is recommended. This, this chart shows how to modify the dose of long-acting insulin. I'm just putting these charts for the completion. You actually need to refer those when you want to modify free of insulin doses. When patient takes two types of insulin, this is regime. Is called, this regime is called self-mixed insulin. This shows the dose modification for those. When this comes already mixed in a single vial, it is called pre-mixed. This is for the pre-mixed insulin. You all know what is short-acting insulin. There are new rapid-acting analogs also. This table shows dose modification of them. The patient now is in the theater. During the surgery, the aim is to maintain satisfactory glycemic control. The glycemic range is 110 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. For critical ill patients, it is 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. CBS level should be checked before induction of the anesthesia and monitoring, monitored regularly during the procedure at least hourly or more frequently if the results are outside the target range. When blood sugar is 180 to 220 milligrams per deciliter, more frequent monitoring is warranted. 
When blood sugar is more than 220, it is needed to correct the intraoperative hyperglycemia using additional subcutaneous rapid acting insulin or insulin infusions. If patient develops intraoperative hypoglycemia, management should follow a GRIP protocol that we will discuss later. Let us see how to manage perioperative hypo, hyperglycemia in patients who are not on insulin infusions. Look at the flowchart on the left hand side. If patient has blood ketonemia more than three millimoles per liter or urine ketones more than three pluses and metabolic acidosis, you need to follow ketoacidosis pathway. Otherwise, give rapid acting insulin subcutaneously and assess the response. If the patient develop hyperglycemic emergencies like diabetic ketoacidosis or hyposmolar coma, start the fixed rate IV infusion, insulin infusion. How do you manage perioperative hypoglycemia? If CBG is less than 70, give 20 to 25% glucose, 100 ml intravenously. Repeat up to three times. If CBG within 70 to 110, consider giving 50 ml. Repeat up to three times. If patient develops hypos, inquire about and look into errors of prescribing, lack of oral intake, delay in parenteral or enteral feeding, which cause insulin glucose mismatch, whether the patient has got any acute kidney injury, and lack of hypoglycemic awareness, etc. Okay, now patient has undergone the surgery. For post-operative period, if they are on variable insulin infusions, I will discuss in due course. The glycemic target would be 110 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Other patients who are awake, the target would be 70 to 220 milligrams per deciliter. For critical ill patients, it is 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Encourage early return to normal eating, which will allow the use of the usual diabetic medications of the patient. Consult the specialist team if the blood glucose levels are outside the acceptable range. Mrs. XY was discharged home post of third day with satisfactory glycemic control. Unfortunately, two days after the discharge, she is brought to the hospital due to recurrence of fever and right hypochondriac pain. On examination, blood pressure was 100 by 70 milligrams per deciliter, and she was tachycardic with pulse rate of 104 beats per minute, and she was ictery. Her blood sugar level was 380 milligrams per deciliter. The diagnosis of septic shock due to peritonitis following bile duct injury was suspected. She was initiated, initially resuscitated, and planned for emergency lapar explorative laboratory followed by ICU admission. How do you prepare for an emergency surgery? Fluid resuscitation, intravenous insulin, correction of serum necrolytes, baseline lab investigations to assess organ functions, all should be done. Now there is an indication for intravenous ins insulin for Mrs. XY. Let's see. What are the indications? She has poor glycemic control. You need to do an emergency surgery with no room to postpone it. And she's expected to keep meal by mouth for a prolonged period. So invariable red intravenous infusion, insulin infusion. There are three different rates. Consider the use of reduced rate if any risk factors for hypoglycemia are present, like renal impairment, low body weight, when starting insulin, 
for the first time in an insulin naive patient. Variable rate insulin infusion is the best method to control hyperglycemia for the post-surgical patients admitted to ICU. Subcutaneous basal insulin can be added to variable rate insulin infusion for more effective control and that help smooth transition to subcutaneous insulin later. How do you prepare the infusion? At 50 units of insulin containing 0.5 ml to 49.5 ml normal saline to prepare 50 ml infusion syringe form. As I mentioned before, continue 80% of long-acting insulin subcut along with the infusion. Monitor CBG hourly and adjust the rate accordingly. In this chart, there are three main columns to represent three different infusion rates. This shows standard rate. This shows reduced rate for insulin sensitive patients. And this column is for insulin resistant patients. After the exploratory, exploratory laparotomy, the patient was transferred to the ICU. So what are the glycemic targets for critically ill patients is ICU? It is 140 to 180. And we can consider target of 110 to 180 if it can be achieved without significant hypos. In terminally ill patients and in patients with severe comorbidities, higher glucose range might be acceptable. Intravenous insulin is a preferred method to achieve normal glycemia. There are numerous protocols and algos to follow. In our ICUs, University of Washington protocol is a widely used one. This is the protocol of University of Washington. Measure blood glucose levels frequently as appropriate, ranging from every 30 minutes to every two hours, and there are more sophisticated methods for continuous glucose monitoring. Those will pick the tendency for hypos than point of care testing. Now, patient is ready to be transferred to the surgical ward. Before that, let us see how do we convert insulin infusion to subcut regime. It is possible once patient is stable, or poisopressors extubated and eating or being maintained on stable regime of interloparental nutrition. The transition should take place when the next meal related subcutaneous insulin dose is due. Example, with breakfast or lunch. The conversion may vary according to the insulin regime that you are planning to start. There are several regimes, basal bolus, twice daily premix insulin, or the subcut continuous infusion, etc. Finally, we'll briefly discuss how to follow up stress induced hyperglycemia with normal HP1C. Hyperglycemia can be managed as discussed above and discussed with and patient can be discharged with anti-diabetic drugs if normal glycemia is not achieved post-op. And they should be reviewed in one month with repeat fasting blood sugar and arranged medical follow-up. These are the take-home messages. This is a summary table showing the glycemic targets at various levels. Thank you.